Hello and welcome everyone to another webinar series from the Olive Wellness Institute. My name is Abby and I'm a part of the Olive Wellness Institute health team um, back here in Australia. We really appreciate you all taking the time from I'm sure your very busy day to learn more about the role of extra virgin olive oil in improving clinical risk factors. So just um, a few housekeeping points I need to make before I pass over to Mary. Um, so after the presentation from Mary, we'll have a short um, questions and answer session. So please feel free throughout the presentation to write any questions you may have in that little comment box at the bottom left hand corner that you see. Um, we will endeavour, of course, to get to as many questions as possible, but um, however, as time is quite limited, um, we might not get to all questions. But um, we will take note of all the questions, I'll liaise with Mary and we'll make kind of a document of those questions and send the questions and answers to you post-webinar. Um, at the end of the webinar also, I'm just going to pop up a small survey. I um, would just appreciate if you could take the time. It's very short, only five questions. This kind of helps us improve and continue these education opportunities. Okay, so I'd now like to welcome our presenter for today's webinar, Associate Professor Dr Mary Flynn. Mary is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Brown University and a research dietitian at the Miram Hospital, where she has worked since 1984. She is the outpatient dietitian at the Miram Hospital for Oncology, Men's Health, Kidney Stone Centre and the Medical Clinic. Her main research interest is, for, is how food can be used as medicine and of course her main food of interest is extra virgin olive oil, which she has been researching since 1998. In 2013, she founded the Olive Oil Health Initiative of the Miram Hospital that has, been, that has a mission of educating the public and medical community on the health benefits of olive oil. She has developed a plant-based olive oil diet that she has tested for weight loss in women diagnosed with invasive breast cancer, in men with prostate cancer <coughs> for weight loss and improvements in components of metabolic syndrome and to decrease food insecurity in food pantry clients. So welcome Mary, thank you so much for your time today and I will now pass over to you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how extra virgin olive oil can improve some clinical risk factors. I'll be naming some that I think are more interesting, but certainly send in questions um, as we're going along. Um, I just want to say as, as a point of disclosure is that I'm on the advisory panel for the Olive Wellness Institute, which is sponsoring this. And I do have in the past received partial funding for some pilot work through Cobram Estates, the, from the, the group also um, that uh, Abby works with. And the funds, I, but I don't accept any funds for speaking about extra virgin olive oil. That, that's something that I, I keep separate. I just think it's a really fascinating food and hope that I can, I can convince you of the same. Okay, so I first became interested in extra virgin olive oil uh, when you look around uh, the countries that border the Mediterranean Sea. There are there were later lower rates of heart disease and can, a number of cancers. Uh, some of that has changed somewhat because these are westernized, but this is looking at information before 1970, 1960 or so. You're probably all familiar uh, with the components of the traditional diet, and I think it's important to call it traditional because the diet definition has changed in the last 15 years, and I'll mention that um, in a moment there. But extra virgin olive oil is, um, is, is a major component of all the diets. The plant-based part, what vegetables they use, what fruit, what grains or starch, those change depending on the country. But olive oil uh, follows all the extra virgin olive oil follows all the, the, the countries. They border the, the, the sea. The uh, Greeks brought it to um, the Romans, and the Romans spread it out. There's different maps you can look at that are pretty interesting, showing how it spread. They spread it with them because the tree was interesting. The tree had a lot of benefits besides the fruit and the oil. And then red wine. I'm not going to talk about red wine, but that's another uh, topic that I talk about because I think that's a pretty fascinating uh, area of, of, of um, information. So I'm going to be talking about the, I'm talking, talking about olive oil specifically, but I think it is important to, to keep in mind that uh, vegetables go hand in hand with extra virgin olive oil, which I'll talk a little bit about. So it's not, I don't think you can just take out extra virgin olive oil and dump it on a bad diet and expect to see benefit. But the first, first, um, all right, so yeah, the first uh, study that was done, and, and I know there are problems with the way the uh, seven country study, the way it was done, the, um, the diet history, and we all know as dietitians, assuming you're all dietitians, it's really hard 
to get good diet information. But if you look at the countries, you definitely saw a lower rates of heart disease. That's what they were looking at uh, for the countries in the, in the, um, that were in the Mediterranean, particularly Greece. But what has changed? The new definition is, is the med diet score. So my problem with this is it used the ratio of monounsaturated fat to saturated fat in the diet. Um, I do not consider this useful because if you look at uh, food consumption tables from the United States, you'll see that up until about 2004, 2005, our major source of monounsaturated fat was beef. Uh, salad oils were a little bit behind, and then salad oils took over by 2010 or so. But still, uh, salad oils and red, beet and red meat make up the bulk of our monounsaturated fat. So even if we were capturing extra virgin olive oil, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of confusion in what people are consuming. So I don't like the med diet score. I don't find it useful. So if you see a an article published and it says the Mediterranean diet did, did or didn't do anything, and it's from the U.S. or from a non-Mediterranean country, um, I always suggest to my students that they go to the methods and say how are they defining the Mediterranean diet because you really need to know that if they're not using olive oil, uh, you're not going to get the benefits. Okay, that's, the med diet score is, is pretty worthless as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so extra virgin olive oil to me is key, and that's what I'm hoping you'll, you'll realize that once you, once you finish this uh, area. So what I'll be talking about, some of the things I'll be talking about is excess oxidation. Uh, as we know, we cannot stop oxidation because we breathe in oxygen. But excess oxidation is related to everything, aging, all cancers, heart disease, a lot of diseases. Uh, and if you can control it, you can change you can change people's prognosis for a number of things. We'll also be talking about lipids, um, uh, mainly uh, the lipoproteins, but um, lipids and lipoproteins in, in the role of extra virgin olive oil, blood pressure, blood levels of glucose and insulin. Uh, these are where I think are really interesting, and I think the role of olive oil will, um, and I'll keep saying olive oil, I should say that up front, but I mean extra virgin olive oil. That's on the next slide, I'll talk about it. Uh, but I think the ability, the role of extra virgin olive oil in this area is really where it it's really makes a huge difference in health. The role of olive oil in inflammation and also cancer initiation and treatment. So what is extra virgin olive oil? So it's the juice of the olive. It is a natural food. It's the only oil we have that is a juice. Okay, they just squeeze the olives. Um, you can go on websites and see how it's made if you have not seen this, but they crush the olives, squeeze the oil out. They can take out the pits in the skin. Um, but the health benefits are from the phenols. There's these specific phenols that are in extra virgin olive oil. Uh, I'll, I'll mention some of them when they're, when they're relevant to what I'm speaking about. But the health benefits are definitely not from the monounsaturated fat content. How, how I can say that is that there are enough studies in Europe looking at olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, with specific phenol content uh, and, then, and then they look at refined olive oil, which has little to no uh, extra, I'm um, sorry, little phenol. So the phenol content is reported as milligrams per kilogram or parts per million. So if you look at um, what's refined, you can call it refined, but it has less than 20. It's basically stripped, no phenols. So when you compare them to some of the other ones, like this is, um, I give high is over 300. But there are certainly some Greek olive oils that go up way, way high, so they would not consider this high. But if you look at the general international market, um, 300 is where I start to say it's high because you start to see more health benefits. Uh, most retail brands are 90, which would be a really low amount, to like low 200s. But there are some other ones, um, like the Colavita ones. I have data from them. I don't know if I'm supposed to name names here. But uh, the Colavita is a U.S. brand that has given me information in the Cobram Estate ones, and they're much higher than 200. So those are two ones that, that you could say are higher. The phenols depend on the olive you're using. There's a fair amount of olives, and only a, a small number of them are, are currently being harvested in any great number because my understanding is they're, they're a little easier than others, but there is some movement to uh, start to use some of the more unusual ones. Uh, it depends on you grow, you can harvest, you can, you can stress the plant, you can make more phenols, so you can get a lot out of that. And as I said, in the study methods, you want to look for the word extra virgin olive oil. And uh, when I talk to uh, fellow scientists, we're sort of a growing community working in this, um, I, I really encourage them to put the phenol content of the extra virgin olive oil, the olive varietal, if they know it, where they got it from, as much information, because I think it will really help clean up 
uh, the international literature. But if it says midnight score, don't even bother reading it. You're not going to get uh, you're not going to get benefits that that you would expect. Okay, so then buying of extra virgin olive oil. You may know this, but you de the U.S. government does not currently does not well control imported olive oil. There's fabulous imported olive oil. There's no question about that, but it's a very confusing uh, situation. I think uh, I get the sense from working with people in the industry that this hopefully will change soon. Um, California does control uh, is controlled by the USDA, and there's a um, organization called the California Olive Oil Council, and they list all their members and they have a little gold seal that you could look for if you if you happen to be able to get California olive oil. Um, I'm on the East Coast and we, we can't get a lot of it here but I know there's websites so when I go to the West Coast I can get it there. But in boutique stores uh, and I think this is another area that seems to be cleaned up on the East Coast. We had a while there some boutique stores that really weren't selling extra virgin olive oil but uh, it should be in a, in a, in a tin it's distributed from a tin, and then they should list the phenol content. Um, people who know olive oil know you want to know the phenol content. So if it's not listed, you might be suspect. Uh, and then so I think some stores will list the specific phenols, or some of the owners I find know uh, which specific phenols are, are in the olive oil that they're selling. So that's a little bit on buying of it. So to talk a little bit about the benefits. So oxidation, as I said, you want to keep it under control. Um, and as you probably all know, polyunsaturated fats very readily oxidize. They get in our body and they just uh, will break down. So the main source in the United States of, of, uh, of the polyunsaturated fats are vegetable seed oils. Soybean is our most prominent now, but also safflower was before it. Corn was earlier. Corn is kind of coming back. Um, I'll speak a little bit about that um, when I get to LDL. Um, but these are, these oils are in margarines, they're in commercial salad dressings. They will oxidize. They will oxidize. The USDA uh, in the past, I'm not sure what they're saying now, but in the past what they said was don't eat more than, you know, X percent, like 10 percent of your calories or I think it's like 13 percent or whatever. Um, and I think what they're thinking of is, is essential fatty acids. But extra virgin olive oil has, um, has the has enough of the uh, the polyunsaturated fats? They have a small amount, this, but they do have it. So you're not going to you're not going to get a deficiency by using extra virgin olive oil. But um, fish oils also are high in polyunsaturated fats, and there were studies showing that fish oils and vegetable seed oils both will oxidize LDL. So the oxidation of DNA will can start cancers. The oxidation of cell membranes is, promotes cancer. So we don't want to we want want to have excess oxidation. The oxidation of LDL leads to atherosclerosis. I'll talk more about that um, in, a, in a couple of slides, but it is oxidized LDL that's the problem. You have healthy LDL, and that won't contribute or won't contribute well to atherosclerosis, but oxidized well. So oxidation in extra virgin olive oil. So olive oil is primarily monounsaturated fat. It does have some saturated. It does have some poly, but it's mainly mono, so it's not going to easily break down. Um, also, it has the highest content for an oil of alpha-tocarphal, alpha which is the form of vitamin E that acts as an antioxidant. And the, then high phenolic content one. So this is some, some data. This is like a 366 total phenol versus a 164. So 164 would be an okay retail one. This study showed that, um, that 366 would decrease the oxidation of LDL, but the 164 did not. And this one um, showed a, a, a higher one, um, over 500 is, is reasonably high compared to, again, a retail one. There was a decrease in DNA oxidation in this study, showing that the higher phenols might be needed to get that oxidation to happen. Uh, but you're not oxidizing it your, yourself if you're using primarily um, extra virgin olive oil. The blood lipids and lipoproteins, as I said, oxidized LDL is the issue. Okay, healthy LDL is really not that big of a deal. Um, as you probably know, the idea that you have to get it, uh, the LDL below 100, around to 70, uh, that's pretty much pharmaceutically driven. It's not driven by uh, good science. I think that the, my understanding is the studies show that um, like 125 is kind of, that's where people kind of do the cutoff for it being a problem. So we don't have data, to my knowledge, that shows you really need to get it to 70, okay? But if, it's, if you're using extra virgin olive oil, even if it's high, you're not going to have oxidized LDL. But compared to vegetable seed oils, that should say seed, um, extra virgin olive oil may or may not decrease LDL. So this gets into the corn oil ad. 
Corn oil, um, people are, are, put, have an ad, and I keep getting it from patients, so I, that's why I'm bringing it up, saying that corn oil decreases LDL more than extra virgin olive oil, which is true. They point to a study. The study they referenced was actually not the complete study. I don't know why they went, didn't use the complete study, but if you go to the ad, the little reference they give you, if you Google it or go on um, like a PubMed thing, you can get the, uh, the finished study, and it's not that different. But corn oil will decrease LDL more than, than extra virgin olive oil. That's a true story. But what is the not leave, the not saying is it will decrease the LDL and it will oxidize the LDL. So your average person, your average physician, I would almost warrant to say, maybe even dietitians, don't know that oxidized LDL is what you want to worry about. So it sounds like a good ad, but um, it's not it's not the whole truth. Okay, it's one of those labeling things which I'm sure at least some of you have some quabble with. Um, okay, so um, vegetable seed oils don't, they will lower LDL more, but they will also increase the oxidation. And there's some evidence that the high phenol content, over 300, 400, may lower LDL. So part of this um, confusion, I think, is that um, there's a decrease in, you can see a um, decrease in LDL, but we don't know which specific phenols. It's probably one that's more important than others. Uh, but I think what's more interesting is that uh, there is a linear increase in HDL with phenolic content. So the higher the phenolic content, the higher the uh, HDL will go. And I have certainly had plenty of um, patients or patients of mine, patients of cardiology friends, saying when people start using extra virgin olive oil, their HDL goes up. So that's a good thing. So we, that's, to my knowledge, there is, well, I know there's no medicine that will raise HDL independently, but um, there's no food. It's the only other food. So then this study looked at three tablespoons for three weeks of extra virgin olive oil versus canola oil, a random assignment to the order they start. And what they showed was these people started with a high HDL. They were men. They started with an HDL around 47. So at the end of this, this trial, the, between the two oils, there was no difference in um, total HDL. But when they were on extra virgin olive oil, the HDL2 was higher. You may know that HDL2 is the part of HDL that has the health benefits. And then in this study, they looked at two tablespoons a day for three weeks of refined olive oil versus a moderately high phenol extra virgin olive oil. And they found that, again, there was higher HDL2, so the particle was better, but also the higher phenol content enhanced the HDL work. Okay, it made it work better. So that's a really good thing. That's a really important thing. It may be pretty critical to the cardiovascular benefits, but there's plenty more coming. Okay, so blood pressure. This is very reproducible, and this information is, is fairly old. Um, compared to sunflower oil, so sunflower is what the Europeans use for vegetable seed oil. But in this study, they gave two tablespoons to women, three tablespoons to men. They did it by size. But extra, two, two or three tablespoons um, of extra virgin olive oil a day for six months, significant decrease in both systolic and diastolic. Um, extra virgin olive oil very um, very reproducibly decreases systolic. Dystolic, diastolic, I find a little uh, more, it's not as consistent, but, you know, it can be there. This study is in older people, 84-year-old people. They gave them four tablespoons a day for four weeks. So more olive oil, shorter time. Uh, and what they showed was just a decrease in uh, systolic, which, as I say, I've seen with some of the retail oils. I've got, when I get up to the higher ones, which this one has, these this side has, I'm sorry. This was men, and they looked at 161, which is a retail brand, versus refined. Three tablespoons a day, three weeks. That lowered systolic. Now, in this study, the study was women, but, um, you know, the same, same type of situation. They had both of these, all of these had hypertension. Um, this was a higher phenol content, with four tablespoons a day for eight weeks. So higher amount, longer time period. Lowered both systolic and diastolic. Blood levels of insulin and glucose, this is what I said, this is one I find really fascinating, uh, the ability of olive oil to do this, because this is older information, too. But why I worry about it is um, I don't have as many straight diabetics. Most of my diabetics have uh, cancer. But if you look at higher but within normal levels of both insulin and glucose, so higher levels, you see an increase in um, heart disease and a whole, a whole host of cancers. Blood cancers are really interesting, uh, related to higher glucose in particular. So this study um, was published around, I think it was 2000, <clears throat> excuse me. They took two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil a day for two weeks versus sunflower oil. 
So these are all random assignment studies to order, I mean. And this showed a significant decrease in fasting glucose and insulin. Then they had the same group, they, they get, called it an olive oil enriched diet, which was unfortunate because they don't say how much the people use a day. This is similar to what Predimed does. You may be familiar with the Predimed studies. They give them olive oil to use a day, but they, they say that they tell them to use four tablespoons. But this was olive oil enriched diet versus vegetable oil. This is a sunflower oil study. It was in Ireland for eight weeks. What they showed was uh, they looked at insulin sensitivity. They looked at glucose transport across the membrane, and they showed that um, the extra virgin olive oil improved glucose transport. So that was pretty exciting. I remember reading that in 2000. It's one of the first studies I read showing specific benefits, not just from a country standpoint. Also improved vasodilation. Talk a little bit about, um, well, more inflammation, not vasodilation. But there are plenty of studies showing that um, extra virgin olive oil improves endothelial function. And this study was interesting because they, they took the same amount of pasta and eggplant. This is in Italy. And one time they fried it in olive oil, and the other time they just added the olive oil to it. It was two and a half tablespoons to this amount here. And they showed that when they cooked these foods into extra virgin olive oil, they had a better lowering of glucose and insulin compared to just adding it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, cooking vegetables in olive oil, but there are studies showing that cooking food into extra virgin olive oil has benefits beyond just adding it to food or taking it as a shot. I have some patients that like to do that. So I'm just going to mention briefly a small uh, small pilot study I did. So what I did was I looked at men who were on surveillance for prostate cancer, and they were um, they were reasonably they weren't underweight by any means, but they weren't terribly overweight. So I put them on the prostate cancer foundation diet versus my extra virgin olive oil diet for eight weeks each of weight loss, random assignment, and they had to use three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil a day when they were on uh, my diet. On the prostate cancer diet, they ate more, able to eat more lean poultry, seafood, and meat. Um, I call that whole family, the whole group, um, animal flesh, because I think it's just easier to, to visualize what you're talking about, because um, then you know what people are eating for extra protein. I just I think that there's problems with people eating too much uh, protein in general. So what you, you can't eat too much protein with a plant-based diet. It's really animal-based ones. But they had three tablespoons a day of extra virgin olive oil. And... Uh, the olive oil total phenol content was 635. This was a good tasting olive oil. They really liked it. Um, this came from Cobram Estates. Um, they, the patients actually were asking me how to get it, so I was able to get it into Rhode Island. And what we were looking at was this one specific phenol called allurapine, which was the highest phenol in the oil. So when I finished, there was no difference in weight loss between the diets. I had done an earlier study with women with breast cancer, and in the, on the olive oil diet, there was better weight loss. But in this one, no difference in weight loss. But what I thought was really interesting was this gives you the blood levels of insulin and glucose and then the measured, indirectly measured um, insulin resistance after the diet. So these, were, these values were an a, um, average of two samples separated by three days. So after the prostate cancer foundation diet, their insulin was 13.7, decent standard deviation here. Um, after the olive oil diet, it was down to 11.5. That has a p-value of 0.02. Uh, glucose was 104. It got to below 100 after the olive oil diet. And then um, the amount of insulin they needed, this is an indirect way to measure insulin sensitivity. Uh, it was it was still, this, this wasn't great. I mean, you want to be low 1.9, but still went down significant. So this is... Same people, same weight loss, but better values when you were, they were on extra virgin olive oil. So the information, as you probably know, is response to disease, level of disease. Clinically, it can be measured with CRP. Uh, but there are other things like looking at IL-6, um, other things like that. But there's one phenol called oleocanthal. And this is one of the phenols, one of the main ones, that gives the uh, uh, kind of a, I hate to say sting, but they call it a sting on the back of the throat. So if you were tasting extra virgin olive oil and you slurped it in and hit the back of your throat, if you kind of coughed the eyes watered temporarily, not you know, problematic, uh, that's oleocantho, very often oleocantho. So this has been shown to inhibit the COX-2 enzyme, which it causes inflammation. So working the same way that uh, non-steroidal um, uh, anti-inflammatory agents work. It has the same action as ibuprofen, the lab that discovered this, completely different structure, but the same but the same um, ability to work. So then to talk a little bit about olive oil and cancer protection. This is, I think this is a little trickier, but I do think there's going to be a role, um, a good role, of extra virgin olive oil and cancer. And if you work with cancer patients, you know, they, they, they want to they control as much as they can. 
So if I can even get them to start using extra virgin olive oil, I think you know that's, that's something good for them. Um, so oleocanthal that I just mentioned, the same lab that had discovered it, what the, I'm sorry, I spelled that wrong. Um, what they showed in a test tube, so they put healthy cells and then breast and prostate cancer cells in the tube. And the oleocanthal selectively killed the cancer cells, which is, to me was pretty fascinating. Uh, squalene is an oil olive oil, and it's been shown to be a tumor inhibitor. Uh, there were some people in Europe that uh, feels squalene content of extra virgin olive oil is, is um, largely responsible for the protection from cancer, but I think you can make a case it's a lot of other things, not just that. Most of the squalene uh, will migrate to the skin and it gives a UV protection, so it's thought to be at least one of the reasons that people in the Mediterranean countries have far less skin cancers than the rest of the world. And then aloripine, which I mentioned earlier in a test tube, that will inhibit cancer cell invasion, regress tumors. So there's some work being done with the phenols, not as much with um, straight extra virgin olive oil, but I'm looking at it in cancer patients from the standpoint of how it will improve insulin and glucose. Because my feeling is that um, elevated blood glucose potentially provides uh, for food for the cancer cells, feeds the cancer cells. So it's not eating sugar, it's the, it's the blood sugar. Patients think they, if they eat sugar that Help that's uh, something bad to their cancer. It does not. It's, it's blood sugar that, that is the problem. So if you can lower the glucose and insulin, uh, you will help keep the cancer under control. Then body weight. So when I first started working with extra virgin olive oil in 1998, I compared a diet that was rich in extra virgin olive oil to a lower fat diet. So I wanted to say that you can lose weight if the calories are controlled. And um, since, since that time, these and I did show that. I did show that that, that did happen. That's the last how the last point on the slide, but if you look at the Mediterranean diet adherence, these are, these are um, studies out of Spain and Greece, what they showed was that the better people adhered to the diet, which in these countries would include extra virgin olive oil, and they both report that out, the lower the, the BMI. The Sun study is a big study in Spain, and um, they it was not a significant difference, but there was a trend for the highest amount of olive oil reported at, at baseline the least likely they were to gain weight. Uh, this study out of Israel, this is the, the um, you may be familiar with this one, this is a cafeteria study um, where they've changed their food. It was pretty interesting the way they did it. It was only in the women. The women weren't a large part of it, but the women had better weight loss with the Mediterranean diet versus a lower fat diet. And then this is the reference to um, the first study I did uh, where it showed that when um, women, when you compared the Cancer Institute diet, which is the, the women in my study ate about 28% fat, was my memory, um, and they had, on my plant-based diet, they had to use three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil a day. Uh, they liked the extra virgin olive oil diet a lot better, and they um, lost more weight when they started with it, if you, when you looked at um, what happened with the weight loss. So vegetables and olive oils. I said, I do feel that they go hand in hand, and that's a good thing. Um, carotenoids, as, as you likely know, give pigment to plants. So the, the more color to the plant, the more um, carotenoids that are in the plant. So for that reason, I recommend my patients use at least some frozen produce. Because uh, in, the, in the Northeast, in Rhode Island, where I practice, uh, we don't get a big growing season. We're practically, I think we're pretty much out of it right now, although we've had a warm week. Uh, but if you use frozen produce, that has been grown to peak ripeness, and it's going to be higher in carotenoids, definitely. Uh, other phytonutrients have been shown also. But when the carotenoid get into the bloodstream. They're very powerful at fighting cancer. They work in things like um, cell communication, and they keep the lines of communication open so surrounding cells can kill up the cancers. Um, but, and that's been, the, the Cancer Institute and the American Cancer Society, I think, have got people really aware of color is important. But what they don't say, for whatever reason, is that carotenoids need fat to be absorbed. And I think it explains why in the U.S., to my knowledge, we don't really have a good study saying eating fruits and vegetables would decrease your cancer risk. Whereas in Europe, they show carotenoid levels, follow them over time, and say higher carotenoid levels at baseline mean less cancer. But the Europeans use more fat with the vegetables than we do. It could be butter, it could be cream, it could be olive oil, but they're not big on boiling them um, for the most part. This other study showed that when you cooked vegetables into fat, you had even higher absorption of the carotenoids. So cooking vegetables in um, extra virgin olive oil, which is a healthy fat, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, because I'm sure at least some of you um, are under the mistaken notion that you cannot cook with olive oil, and that, that is wrong. Uh, the other family that's really important are the glucosinolates. These are in the cruciferous vegetables. 
So the vegetables that um, that you know we have problem getting people to consume because of the sulfur content. But these are uh, very powerful at, at fighting cancers. Primarily, prostate and breast have been the most studied, but cancer in general is thought to be protected. Primarily, prostate and breast have been the most studied, but cancer in general is thought to be protected with the glucosinolates. Um, but what I think it's left out is they're water soluble. Their study, the study showed that if you steam these vegetables, which is what my patients tend to do before they meet me, when you steam these vegetables, uh, you are losing what makes them water soluble. soluble. Now, I have an italics that's preserved with fat, because there's one study that did suggest that. But I, what happens here is the carotenoids come in with the chylomicron. So that's why you need fat. I don't know if they come in here. So that's why I got a little question mark. But I do know that the studies out of Europe show protection when, um, when uh, patients in, the, in Europe use glucosinolate-containing vegetables, but not in the United States. OK, so those are two important reasons. But really, what I think is, even if that wasn't so, um, when people start to use uh, extra virgin olive oil with their vegetables, they taste better, and they increase the intake. I'm just always shocked at how much, uh, what a thought large increase I get out of patients when they start to use extra virgin olive oil compared to none. And I do a lot of crossover studies like that, small ones, but I have shown consistently, uh, and even patients in my clinical practice, vegetable consumption really goes up. So the cost of olive oil. I always feel obliged to bring this up because people will say, oh, it's so expensive, or Patients, when I ask them what brand they're, they're buying, they'll say, uh, whatever's the cheapest, whatever's on sale. And that, that is not a good thing. Um, if you look at price per tablespoon, uh, the a typical 500 ml bottle or 16.9 ounces, which is sold traditionally in the United States, so it's like your standard one, that is 32 tablespoons. So if you were paying $32 for it, um, you would be paying about $30 a dollar a tablespoon. And most, you can get good olive oil around 10 to $12, so under 40 cents a tablespoon. Uh, the health, it should be in everyday food. It really should. It should be incorporated in people's diet if they want help. Uh, the benefits seem to start around two tablespoons. More is better, like a lot of the studies did three, but there are enough studies using two to show that's where they start. More would be better. And uh, from what I can read of the literature, you see benefits in about three weeks. Some studies go out longer and don't have that time point, but uh, studies that look at three weeks do see I uh, do see the benefits at that time. And then a tablespoon of olive oil per cup of vegetables. That's what I recommend. Extra virgin olive oil. So you're putting a tablespoon in a pan. You're adding a cup of vegetables, two tablespoons, two cups of vegetables. You're not just drizzling it. You're really using enough of it. Well, the other thing at the price of it, uh, if, you, if you look at European oils, um, I don't know what's going to happen with tariffs. I think that's like the new thing uh, looming for us, you know, international tariffs. But if you, you can't produce a good bottle of extra virgin olive oil for under about $10 or $12. And if it's coming from another country and you're paying taxes and shipping and whatever, uh, that's, you know, if you see some of these store brands that are $8, $6, $8, whatever, they can't be extra virgin olive oil. You couldn't make it for that. Okay, so in the United States, you can see the California ones at a better price. Um, and you can, as they say, go to that website for California Olive Oil Co Council and look at to see what they recommend for their members. So. You can't use cheap, you cannot use cheap olive oil and expect to get the benefits because it's not going to be extra virgin. So then cooking with extra virgin olive oil, uh, that you can use to cook. That is a complete piece of misinformation that I get in every lecture I, I um, have given. So I always remember to stick a slide in. So the phenol benefit is lost with light heat and oxygen, but oxygen's the worst. Uh, this study was a study I was involved with at UC Davis, and what they did was they put olive oil in a pan on the top of the stove with a medium heat. Then they put extra virgin olive oil, all extra virgin. Then they put some in a stove at, I believe it was 420 Fahrenheit. And what, they cooked it for 10 minutes or 20 minutes. And what they showed was in the stove at a higher temperature, you did not have as much loss. You lost, we really lost it was on top of the stove. Oxygen is what's going to take it out. Um, and then this is, this is a study done by the Australians. And they looked at a range of oils, including um, coconut oil and grapeseed oil and avocado oil, I believe, and canola oil and extra virgin olive oil, virgin olive oil, and just refined olive oil. And what they showed was extra virgin olive oil had the lowest pole compounds and oxidation byproducts. That's a good thing. Extra virgin olive oil, by definition, does not have a lot of free fatty acids, whereas refined, refined olive oil would. Canola oil was the worst. Canola oil feared the worst. The other thing, if you, if you look at this reference, they, they talk about how um, the smoke point is, is pretty irrelevant, a couple of reasons. One is 
it, we don't cook at smoke point. You wouldn't cook at that. So just, you know, when people bring that up, oh, it's a low smoke point. Extra virgin olive oil actually has a pretty high smoke point. It's higher than most, I think it's higher than all vegetable seed oils. But we don't cook at that. So it's not, it's not a relevant topic. But I have had patients who use extra virgin olive oil cold and then cook with canola. So now I'm quick to point out, you really don't want to do that. I mean, that's not a good thing to do. Um, and then this study out of Spain, it looked at cook cooking vegetables in extra virgin olive oil. So what it did was it, um, they used water, water with some extra virgin olive oil, small amount of extra virgin olive oil, um, like a, and then up to a saute of extra virgin olive oil. And what they showed was that as you increase the extra virgin olive oil, the, the um, ph ph phenolic compounds in the vegetables were conserved and they say it increased it because what you're doing is you're getting phenols in the extra virgin olive oil, phenols in the vegetables, but they made the vegetables healthier. So it really, um, it really made a better product besides, as I said, it tastes a lot better. And when they used water, they had a loss of the phenols. So water was not a good thing to do. So cooking an extra virgin olive oil is great. And as I said, a tablespoon per cup of vegetables. So in conclusion, um, and then as I said, I'll be happy to take questions when this is finished, but if you consistently use at least two tablespoons of olive oil a day, extra virgin olive oil, for in about three weeks, you're going to improve your blood pressure, you're going to improve your blood glucose and insulin, oxidation and inflammation. You're going to improve the health and the level of your blood lipids and lipoproteins. You're going to uh, lower your body weight. That's, that's something that I see consistently and decrease the risk of weight gain. And I didn't mention um, this and when I talked about costs. I apologize. I should have. But um, I work in a fair amount in food insecurity. And so after I did one of my first studies uh, with the woman with breast cancer, what they said early on was, this is so inexpensive to eat this way, olive oil, vegetable, and a starch. Um, and I'm on the board of the food bank, where I'm community food bank, and I did a lot of work in food pantries. So I developed a cooking program, and I went into cooking, uh, went into food pantries. And what I wanted to say was low-income people will use these recipes that were olive oil, vegetable, and starch. For, our goal was three meals a week, and they ended up eating them. It was 2.8 plus or minus. I think it was 1.7, so close. Uh, and if they do, they will spend less on, on grocery costs. And I'll say to you as dietitians, there was nutrition, no nutrition education. We just said, here's these recipes, make these recipes. We gave them some food during the cooking program, and I collected the grocery receipts four weeks before through the six weeks of cooking and six months after. And what I found was that, um, yes, they spent a lot less on groceries. What they did, though, they bought less meat, uh, less snacks, less desserts, less carbonated beverages, uh, and they um, they also they, we, they decreased measured food insecurity. We used the USDA food insecurity 18 item questionnaire. So they decreased the food insecurity, uh, but they also all lost weight. It was really, it speaks to the fact that eating too much dietary protein will lead to weight gain. It just will. Um, and I think that's, that's, not, that's not appreciated. Uh, people are very big at um, it's recommending people use lean poultry and lean seafood, um, they, they're just going to lead to weight gain. And, and, and I define health as the absence of chronic diseases or improvement in risk factors. So in my mind, they don't improve our health. Uh, they really don't improve our health, and so I don't recommend them. Vegetables and olive oil can't go wrong. So the last slide just says the website, which is the Olive Wellness Institute, which is, is um, sponsoring this. And then this is a website I have, medfooddiet.com. It has some basic, I developed it for the Brown Medical School. Um, but it has, and it's, it was developed for a cooking program I did for low-income type 2 diabetics. But it does have some of the recipes to give you a, a sense as to how I put food together. And it also has, um, it has how to implement the program. There's a, four videos my students made um, the summer of 2018 that show how the cooking program goes. So it's really easy to do. If you work with any anyone working with low income, please feel free to use it. It's a real easy program to administer. And um, it's a lot of fun. I have some my students teaching it, and they really seem to enjoy it. Okay, so I will be happy to take questions if people are putting them in. I don't know if Abby's getting some there. Hi, Mary. Thank you very much for that. Um, that was fantastic. I just love the way you're able to explain research so well and make it easy, especially for me, and I'm sure others too um, understand what that research actually meant. So thank you. Um, there hasn't been any questions come through yet, but they do usually come through afterwards. But um, I've got some that um, I could okay. ask. Um, so. How would you okay. recommend someone um, in the US to be looking for a good quality um, extra virgin olive oil? I know you mentioned um, looking for the high phenol content, but if people are kind of looking at olive oil or extra virgin olive oil, kind of which way would you kind of yeah, turn them and 
a little bit for a good one. Do you mean in a retail store? Yeah. Like in my yeah. retail store. Yeah, well, see, that's why I think, um, well, I recommend Colavita and then Cobram Estates. Um, and as I've worked with them for a number of years, and their olive oil is just fantastic. Um, but there are some other ones that, as I say, I, I do direct people to the um, California Olive Oil Council website. And one of the things I'm trying to do with the uh, Californians is try to get them to start posting phenol content on their website when it's when it's harvested. So what happens is you have you can get a total phenol at harvest, and then it will start to decrease, and it will decrease if you mishandle it as a consumer, and certainly could decrease if it's shipped. My my understanding is. Um, you know, if it's if it's if it's kept out of light, you now all the bottles are dark now, so that's not a big issue, and it's kept closed. So when you open it, you want to put the cover right back on. Oh, that's the oxygen problem. And when you open a bottle, you try to use that up before you open a new one, unless you have a big huge household. But you try to use it in, in four weeks is, is I believe still what people feel is optimal. So I think it, it is difficult. It is difficult. And as I say, I talked gave two, um, we gave a number of talks last year to the industry in California, and one of my recommendations or plea was, could people stop posting phenols so we can um, we can start sorting this out and direct people to olive oils? It is difficult. It is difficult. The uh, labeling for extra virgin is based on chemical tests and sensory evaluation, which which are great. That's fine. Um, but I think if we don't know the phenol content, uh, we don't know what we're working with. And so that's why I know the phenol content for Cobram Estates. And I know the fetal content for Colavita, and so that's why I recommend them. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I've got a question come through from Teresa. It says, those in support of non-fat or low-fat will quote that slow mediated dilation after ingestion of high-fat meals report a three-hour decline in pairing endothelial function or the production of nitric oxide, which is lower dilation. I have not seen their studies, but they say it is the same for olive oil. What have you found on FMD? Yeah, so that is, no, no, that, they're right on that. What it is, is I, I spoke, I remember calling that physician, I'm blanking on his name, but he did a lot of talking, he's an older gentleman. Uh, it, they use refined olive oil. They don't use extra virgin. And so, yeah, if you're using refined olive oil, you would expect that it'd be problems with endothelial function. Um, when I spoke to this physician, I think his first, last name begins with an E, like, oh. I can't think. But anyway, um, when I spoke to him, I explained that extra virgin olive oil is a completely different food. This is about oh, at least three, four, five years ago. And um, he said, no, they're not. They're the same thing. You can substitute. You can use one for the other. And I said, no, you can't. If you're using refined olive oil, of course you wouldn't expect to see benefits. So that's the problem with um, studies in the literature, particularly in the U.S. People don't um, say extra virgin. It was a time... Europeans didn't, and I used to email people and say, could you give me information? This is like 15 years ago. But now, my um, outside the U.S., I would say people are pretty good about using, telling you as much as they can about the olive oil. Because people in the industry and people working in the area of science uh, do want people to know that it's important that you know where the olive oil comes from. So, yeah, that's study, I'm aware of that study. And as I say, that does get pointed to, and that that's um, that comes through me at email sometimes. And... I did call the guy, and um, they did not use extra virgin olive oil because they don't feel it's the same thing. And that there is, um, it's a physician, and then some lay people that are backing a um, a plant-based kind of uh, program. I'm, I'm blanking on the name because I I gave a talk locally, and the the, the lay person locally um, got very incensed that I would say that um, we find olive oil and extra virgin were different. She referenced this physician and said, um, I think it has like an ESS something. I can't think of his name. Um, and she, she was very incensed. She said, oh, no, he has done this research or reports on this research, uh, but it's not extra virgin. Right. And there's plenty of studies. I don't talk about endothelial function, but if anybody's interested, I can send those references. They look at IL-6. They look at CRP. They look at TNF. All those will improve with extra virgin olive oil. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Mary. I might um, get those references, and we can add them to the post-webinar email. Um, there's just another question here. Sure. Um, it says, olive oil in my country, which is Mexico, doesn't include phenol content. Um, how, where, and how much does it cost to measure phenol content? Um, that's a good question. I know, um, and you might be able to help them more. I know, like, um, in in California, there's a lab, the modern oils, olives, oils. I don't know how much it costs. I've never paid for it, so I, I, I don't know that answer. But I do know if you contacted even UC Davis Olive Center, they would they could direct you to 
um, two labs that do it. I don't know how many labs do it now. I, I the one the ones I'm thinking of like Modern Al Olives does it. I know UC yeah. Davis does it, but they probably know more people doing it. And yeah. I, so I don't know the cost. Sorry for that. No, yeah, we can find out or post that in the email as well. Um, so that is all the questions that we have right now, Mary. If anyone wants to pop any more through, that's fine. I um, just want to take you to the end slide. I just want to share with you all that the Olive Wellness Institute now has a podcast. Um, it was launched last month. Um, it's available each fortnight and um, obviously a world first Olive Health and Wellness podcast and it focuses on all the aspects of Olive Science and Knowledge. So we have some very um, sought after health professionals including Mary. Um, you were featured this week as well so everyone get on and Please check that out and subscribe. Um, and we're just going to, someone's asked to show the references again, so I'm just going to go back through those. But just so everyone. And I'll send knows. you after this, Abby. I'll send you the, yeah, I'll send you the ones on endothelial function because I just gave that talk at Yale um, where I discussed endothelial function. So that I was doing more like heart disease and more focused on that, not uh, not a general, not a general olive oil thing. There's a there's a huge literature. I mean, you, you folks out there, if you if you do Google it and uh, put it in PubMed, there is a very large literature on extra virgin olive oil. Right. And just so everyone is aware, um, they will be, if you attended this webinar, I will be sending you a copy of the slide so you will have all these references as well. So um, that takes us to the end. So thank you so much, Mary, for your time and thank you everyone for joining us. And hopefully we we'll see you again soon. You will all receive yep, a post webinar email with this information as well. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the interest, folks.